Welcome to this Independence Day special of the Ranveer show. An aim of mine for this podcast has always been to celebrate our country, celebrate our heroes, celebrate the people who are fighting at the borders, fighting outside of the borders to make this a safer, more prosperous land for all the Indians living within it. On today's episode, we have Colonel Subin Balakrishnan of the Special Forces. He's a former officer of the Indian Army. Incredible experiences, incredible perspectives. If you're someone who enjoys conversations about the Army, conversations about the Special Forces, this one's for you. Enjoy this episode. Do share it with your friends. Make sure you follow The Ranvi Show on Spotify. Every episode's available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. Happy Independence Day, everybody. Let's get to know some real life stories of some real life heroes together. Enjoy this episode with Colonel Subin Balakrishnan on the Ranveer Show. Colonel Subin Balakrishnan, honor having you on the Ranveer Show, sir. Always a pleasure, Ranveer. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So uh, right before this podcast started, you were asking me why we're bringing on so many army men on the show. Uh, what's your answer to that? Well, I really don't have an answer. I mean, I, I found it uh, interesting, for, for want of a better phrase, that you actually are uh, investing time and effort in, in getting people from the army, from the special forces background to come and speak. Because uh, that's not something that happens usually in spite of the uh, fairly um, good exposure and good uh, interest out there, it's not been happening very frequently mm. or not as frequently as one would think uh, it should be happening. Until the 2020s with the Ranveer show, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's one way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we want to change. I remember talking to Captain Raghu about this and he's, as I told you earlier, he said that uh, the one place that the Indian Army kind of, you know, would uh, like to improve is their front branding, as in the branding that goes out to the audiences. What do the audiences think of the army? There's a lot of national pride when it comes to the army, but they don't know much about it. People don't know the inner workings of it, especially younger folks. We know more about the US Marines than we know about the special forces. It's absolutely right, you know, and, and it's um, you know, just to carry the conversation that we were having earlier uh, forward. Uh, is that there is so much of uh, so much of latent talent that's available with uh, uh, veterans and people from the armed forces with the background that uh, they have, and I'm. It's always amazed me that it has not really been exploited in the manner that it should mm. for for greater good, mm. and uh, I think that's that's uh, that's an area that there is so much of idle capacity that that we have within the country that yeah. we really don't need to look over our shoulder at what's happening beyond. This, that, that, that's that's tremendous amount of potential that lies there. So we had Major Vivek Jacob on the show. Uh, I'm sure you've checked out that episode, sir. Yes, I did. Um, you had also worked with him on the field. Is that true? Um, like, well, no, we haven't uh, interacted directly. Uh, Vivek is much junior to me. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the spoken reputation does carry and we have oh. uh, interacted, but not, not on, a, on a very regular basis or uh, on an operation uh, uh, singularly. Got it. Um, so the one thing I got from that conversation with him about the Indian Special Forces is that your key word is efficiency. It's all about doing your mission with a lot of efficiency and wherever efficiency is the requirement, the SF is sent in to do the job. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd go one step further. Uh, efficiency is great, but uh, the trick lies in converting that efficiency to effectiveness. Okay. So E to E, uh, you know, e, you could be as efficient as you think you are. Uh, but unless you are able to translate that efficiency to effectiveness on the ground in a certain uh, pool of a situation, uh, I think that that's the trick is in converting that efficiency, which a lot of us have uh, latent or uh, efficiency within us, right? Mm. And we, we, we are constantly in a manner trying to polish it or refine it and to bring it to a certain level. But the trick is, in my opinion, is to convert that efficiency into effectiveness. And mm. that's 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 what the special forces is actually all about. Got it. Uh, probably I'd like to highlight one more thing about the special forces, just as an observer. 
you guys have a lot of friendliness in your demeanor you all have like gentleness in your eyes but i know you all are absolute badasses <laughs> like i'm actually know. killing you with my looks right <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> no you all you all and you all have kind of gone through a very badass environment and it's probably something the aam janta knows but they don't really know so through the medium of storytelling i would love for you to take us through what happened when you were 22 what was your 22 year old mindset and uh, what was that journey from age say 22 to being a uh, all out special forces guy. but why why 22 i'd like to know why why you starting with 22 i think 22 is a key number on this particular podcast we talk a lot about uh twen- being 22 years old maybe it comes from a personal place because i had a whole tumultuous 22 year old phase in my own life a lot of people especially indian guys in particular but also indian women um have to shed off the inner child when they're 22 I'm sure that happens earlier for you guys, slightly earlier. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and, uh, but let me let me rewind a little further, sure, sir. because my story uh, takes uh, sustenance from from there. Uh, the the sprout happens there. Okay. So uh, in the period, uh, probably 16, 17 or thereabouts, uh, is when the switch happened. The switch from uh, a fairly decent, uh, good bloke, uh, good. "Quote unquote," uh, to the wild child, uh, probably uh, you know testosterone <laughs> and uh, <laughs> all the other chemical releases yeah. in the body. But I just just went haywire. And uh, looking back at it now, uh, I can only feel for my folks and what they went through because I, it, it was it was dramatic. It was sudden, uh, and I just went completely berserk. And then. Uh, uh it went to an extent where i fared terribly in my 12th standard board so you know the the drop off was was very sudden very dramatic and uh, was not something that people could could uh, take to very easily and that's when uh, by um, a mixture of circumstances uh, i uh, took the nda exam in fact my dad is from the RIMC I don't know if you heard of it the Rashtriya Indian Military College uh, what it used to be called the Prince of Wales Military College uh, it's established by the uh, the Britishers and uh, uh, one of these uh, term breaks or uh, I think it was my 11th standard break uh, that uh, he had to go to Dehradun on some official work and uh, I, we just tagged along with him and uh, and that's when my dad took us to his old school and then his records were pulled out and you know uh, whole <clears throat> sorry whole kind of stuff that happens in one of these uh, visits and uh, uh, it so happened that the, the principal there knew my dad and uh, old sc- boy school uh, uh, affiliations and whatever uh, they asked me why do you leave your son here for a bit and so my dad turned to me and asked me do you want to stay back here I said, "Wow, this is one good way to get away from home, <laughs> right? <laughs> Some independence." So I said, "Yeah, hell yeah!" <laughs> and so I stayed back there for about a week or so, and I made some fantastic friends. Uh, and I just loved the atmosphere, loved the way that these guys were going about their business, and uh, these these are uh, friendships that uh, endure to to date. And these guys were filling up their forms for the NDA, and I had no clue and uh, whatever. So. uh i filled up the form and uh, went through the written exam uh, which i got through and then the ssb or the uh, the selection services board the interview happened and whatever and uh, when the results were published uh, it came in the newspaper so i was seventh in uh, all india merit and then suddenly from this guy who was uh, uh, you know had been given up for uh, being a nobody it suddenly propels you in in, a, in an entirely different dimension mm. and that that's when i think that first switch happened mm. um and thereafter i went to the nda and everything i i was i was uh, i was decently physically fit uh, um but by nda standards uh, an average guy what can you describe this further like why by nda standards an average guy uh well uh, let's say about uh 60 to 70% and and these figures i'm just giving a uh, it might not be very specific but uh, in somewhere in that uh, uh grouping of uh, youngsters from 
the RIMC or the Russian Indian Military College, the Sanic schools and other feeder institutions to the NDA. So these are the kind of guys that are coming who are from there from the sixth standard, seventh standard or thereabouts and who've been trained in a certain manner to be fit for selection to the NDA. Hmm. So they have the, the grounding of, uh, of a disciplined life, of certain amount of physical fitness and uh, some amount of harampanti, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that qualifies very precisely to make it to the NDA. Okay. And the rest of us guys are coming, you know, from uh, CV Street. Mm. Um, who have no idea about what we are signing up for, uh, the majority of the 30-40%. And some of them are, you know, foggy brats and stuff like that, so they have a fair idea. So from that point of view, you, you, irrespective of whatever people tell you from the outside, uh, you are not really entirely prepared for the force with which it hits you on the day one at the academy. And then the transition that happens within the academy from a blustering, blundering fool to, to getting a little street smart so that you can make it through those two and a half, three years of exposure at the NDA. It takes a little bit of effort. I mean, it, it's nothing extraordinary, but it does take a little bit of effort. Mm. Um, how is the NDA training different from the special forces training that happens after? I'm sure it's dead different. Like it's crazy different. But again, from an arm janta perspective. Sir. Well, uh, see, one of the great fallacies that happens, and I think uh, it was reflected uh, um, fairly in um, Vivek's uh, podcast as well, is that uh, there is a there is a uh, a certain amount of belief out there that you need to be the stud, right? You need to be Johnny Rambo to make it to the special forces, and and that was what I believed as well. Even through NDA and through IMA, I just thought, man, this is something that is not for me, right? I I'm nobody to be getting in there because this is not what I am all about. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the belief out there, uh, and a very mistaken belief, is that you need to be super physically fit and you need to be uh, John Rambo, uh, and that's it. So all brain, no brain. No, no all brawn, no brain. Mm. That's the uh, typical stereotype that has been created over a period of time. I, I don't know if that's the stereotype in the public eye. Because, okay, the... the kind of image that people have of special forces, at least now, is definitely... Some it's changing. Yeah. It's changing. I, I, I think I got to acknowledge that. It is yeah. changing. Uh, but at least from Your my time. perspective yeah. or from that period of time, it was completely that. And got it. a guy who was in the NDA, uh, and you, you can make out, you know, even within uh, peer equivalence, um, within the peer group, you know that, okay, X, Y, Z, these are the three, seven, ten guys who are going to volunteer for the special forces. And it's purely uh, that shortlisting in the mind and the uh, langar gup mm. that goes around mm. is purely based on physical attributes and nothing else. Okay. Right? And those are typically the guys who kind of opt also because it's it's peer pressure. It's it's the, uh, the need and the requirement to be living up to a certain stereotype which has been built over time and so on and so forth. And uh, so we, we went through NDA, we went through uh, IMA, and the typical set of guys who we knew that would opt for the special forces opted for the special forces, went there, and so on. But we were not one of them. We stayed absolutely clear. And then... Uh, so one thing, I just got to cut you short there. The guys who don't opt for the special forces, what's going on in their head? Like, why don't they want to opt for it? Like, is there some kind of... Because it, they believe ye are crazy. Okay, why so? Because... Uh, it requires a certain mindset, right? And it requires uh, a mindset, uh, well, uh, for want of a better term, for a kinky mindset. Uh, completely different, right? Uh, that, that's a kind of the thing, but predicated with a tremendous amount of physical uh, fitness uh, that, that resides in the background. Right. So it's a, it's a combination of, let's say, I'm talking from the mind space of people like me, uh, you know, the the our expectation or our uh, understanding of the situation was a 80-20 uh, proportion. 80% brawn and 20% kinky mindset. A guy who would do something completely different just for the heck of it. Mm. Right? Who does not, uh, who's a non-conformist. Mm. Hatke. Hatke. Mm. Pagal. Hatke lekin pagal. Mm. Right? And that that's the, that's the kind of uh, uh, figurative uh, creature that, uh, that one would draw. Uh, 
it, much later, I recognize how that's a completely incorrect uh, characterization. That stereotype doesn't really work at all. And uh, when you actually start looking at uh, some of the uh, data of people who make it to the special forces and uh, for people who give up thereafter or who don't, don't find uh, uh, that they fit into the scheme of things in the special forces and they drop out. Some of these guys who are all brawn and, um, you know, but they don't, they don't fit in. So it, over a period of time, as you started understanding the system, in fact, till the time I volunteered for the special forces, I had no clarity at all. Even when I volunteered for the special forces, um, I was under the belief that, you know, uh, I'm nowhere in that frame, but yet I'm going to try, mm. right? And I, I, but, but one thing that I was very clear in my mind at that stage is I'm not going to be coming back uh, saying that I did not make it. Mm. I would do whatever it takes and beyond to ensure that I make it. Mm. Uh, although I, in my mind, in the core of my belief, I felt that I'm undercooked from this uh, stereotype. It's only when I went through probation uh, the 90-day period that uh, they ring you out completely, uh, that I realized that, uh, not during the time, but once I cleared the probation, I realized that there is a much larger uh, construct here. Um, the next two obvious follow-up questions are, what was the larger construct? And I'd also love for you to shed some light on what happens in the 90-day period. Okay. In terms of what it does to your body, your mind. So, so the, uh, the, Totality of the essence uh, of the Special Forces probation is about wringing the, the living daylights out of the guy, breaking his uh, biological clock, and putting him under extreme stress to see how he responds. So the, the fundamental belief is when you are exposed to stress over, and when I say stress, I don't just mean physical stress. Physical stress is, a, is an important component of it because prolonged physical stress over extended periods of time starts playing tricks on your mind. And uh, when the physical stress elevates itself uh, cumulatively over a period of time, and it, uh, and it, lowers the ability of your mind to instinctively respond to situations, uh, it's then that they're testing you. Mm -hmm. So the test is not actually the 20 kilometer speed march or the 40 kilometer speed march or the 100 kilometer escape and evasion, but what happens beyond that, that and that's, that's the equation that doesn't seem to hit people. And understandably so, because the focus is all on the, on the physical part of the stress. It's never on the mental part of the stress. However, the, the filter that is applied is not about the physical, so, not so much about the physical part, but it's much more about the mental part. So, so in terms of the physical stress that they apply, what are some of, you know, the examples of what they put your body through? Right. Let, let me, let me try and uh, uh, paint to you a typical picture. And this, this can vary, right? Uh, uh, okay. How a probation is generally carried out is that when I, as a volunteer, I'm volunteering for the special forces. And uh, the, the MS branch, which is the HR equivalent of the Indian Army, it sends out a, a signal saying that, all right, so-and-so person, report to so-and-so unit, your probation starts and so-and-so date. So when, when that uh, uh, connection happens, uh, there is a probation officer, a probation uh, NCO, a non-commissioned officer, who is uh, earmarked to conduct the probation. So they aggregate, you know, they, there may be soldiers who are coming in, there may be officers who are coming in, uh, you know, from different units uh, uh, coming in, and they aggregate them so that there is a certain mass that is there because you cannot run probation for one or two guys, although that also is done. But it's more um, uh, time and uh, economics-wise, it, it works that you have, let's say, 18, 20, 50, 30, 40 people uh, to conduct probation. So it's this core group of uh, one officer, one uh, non-commissioned officer, and probably two, three soldiers who conduct the probation for this group. The sole aim of this group is to break the mental uh, uh, structure or, you know, the, the biological clock, to start the, with is the biological clock. So you, it's, there is no certainty about uh, when certain actions or activities are going to be conducted. 
So typically what happens is there's going to be a lot of elements of physical uh, fitness, right? There, there's going to be a PT, a physical training uh, period. There is going to be some amount of uh, uh, combat uh, uh, experiences. There's going to be some amount of firing. There's going to be some amount of classes that are going to be conducted. Uh, so these classes could happen at 2 o'clock in the night. It could happen at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. It, the PT could be at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes they will let you sleep for 6 hours. Sometimes there will be no sleep for 48 hours at all. Uh, you could have one meal and the next meal may come 24 hours later. There could be three meals fit into mm. four hours and then nothing thereafter. So there is no pattern. They break the pattern mm. completely. Mm. And you're put under continuous increasing cumulative physical pressure, right? And then they inject these classes of technical subjects of demolition, of communication, of navigation, of advanced weapons and stuff like that. These are injected in, in bits and pieces here and there. And then uh, over a period of time where the stress starts to build on you, uh, they conduct tests. So firing, for example, you haven't slept for 48 hours straight. 48 hours, not even a wink. They will not let you sleep for 48 hours. There's someone on your case all the time. And then you're exposed to firing. Mm. So your mental faculties have, have your responses, your biological responses are slowed, God. are dimmed. How, how are you able to fire at that point in time is what they're checking. <laughs> wow. Right? So you, classes have been conducted over a period of, let's say, two weeks on demolitions, on advanced weapons, and so on and so forth, navigation, whatever. Uh, and then there are no tests that are conducted. So when you have been through a 20 kilometer speed march and then PT for two hours or whatever else, and then in the night at about 11 o'clock, suddenly he says, he, he gives you only half an hour reaction time that you're going to have a class for this. So you're going there and mm -hmm. it's human nature that you, you fall asleep because mm -hmm. your body is crying for rest, mm -hmm. right? And that's, the instructor doesn't care whether you're awake or you're sleeping or whatever else, right? And he's imparting instructions to you. And that's going to be tested. So how do you overcome cumulative stress, both from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, retain focus on the mission is the essence of how the probation is conducted. And, and that's what where it uh, all leads to, right? So uh, I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying physical fitness is not important. It's very important. But is physical fitness the only thing? Absolutely not. So you need, there is a filter that is applied. You need to have certain amount of basic physical fitness levels that you need to have. Mm. But that's not what you're actually getting tested on. Uh, there are, of course, a 20 kilometer speed march test. There's a 40 kilometer speed march test. There are battle physical efficiency tests. All these are tests. But you could be average in all of them. And there could be another guy who's ex excellent at all, all of that. But when the real tests are conducted, the guy who's excellent on the physical might not be the guy who's ex excelling uh, on these tests. Which are the mental? Which are the which are the mental calisthenics? Mm. Like, are you allowed to give an example of like the mental tests? Oh, all of these. It, these these are stuff that you have been uh, imparted instructions on. Okay. Uh, there are classes. There are technical classes on demolition, for example. Right. Uh, what kind of explosive? In what mixture to be used for what target? How do you get that? What is the chemical composition of these structures? So the, it, they are fairly technical mm. uh, in nature. Communication, advanced communication. What what kind of uh, uh, equipment works in what kind of manner? Stuff like that. You have been imparted these these instructions. So in a way, it's sort of engineering subjects. Engineering also, based. Also. Got it. What are the non-engineering based subjects in like the you know um, the theoretical side of things? Uh, well, not really. There there is no the. Okay, the other, the other thing that uh, I must uh, um, bring out here is that a special forces soldier, whether it's a, a soldier, a non-commissioned officer or an officer, whoever, a volunteer who opts to the special forces, one of the base criterion is that he's reasonably well aware of his surroundings, hmm. right? His, his ability to, to read material, imbibe what's happening, general awareness levels requires to be high. And there is, a, there is a method behind this madness. Uh, to the base observer or even to uh, a more prolific uh, um, person who understands the system, 
it appears very chaotic. These 90 days is just about physical hammering and, you know, but there, there's, a, there's, a, there's an excellent method behind the madness. Mm. In fact, I'd, I'd like to, uh, uh, Ranveer, bring out uh, one typical example and, and probably you might be able to correlate. I wonder if you saw this uh, uh, little clip about uh, a child who had fallen onto the railway track and one railway employee who had run on the track and gone and picked him up and yeah. brought him out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a fabulous example. Really fabulous example because if you take a look at that uh, clip, and I think the the operative part of that clip is about 14, 15 seconds, right? The child falls onto the track. This guy is standing on the platform and he jumps onto the track and he runs. Three seconds into it, he pauses. You can see it actually in the video. He pauses because he's seeing the uh, train come at him, right? And that pause is for just about a fraction of a second. And you can see the, the, the body language. Should I, shouldn't I? And then he, he says, hell no, I'm going. He goes in, picks up the child, throws him onto the platform, clambers on, and the train passes. Mm. Right. So in that 14 to 15 seconds of that clip, three seconds to reach that the thing, the point of decision and that uh, a question mark that is that is so very clearly visible, right? On his mind, I might get killed. It, it, not just the child, I might get killed as well. And in that fraction of a second, he makes a decision. It's a very decisive moment when he decides to go and full force he goes and picks up the child and the thing. Now, this is a very stressful situation. A humongously stressful situation because there cannot be a greater stress than when your own life is on the line. And very clearly on the line. So the ability of that person to transcend that decision point, that very critical, very um, deliberate decision point. And he transcends that and he makes up his mind and he goes for it and completes the mission. Mission, mission focus, mm -hmm. right? So if you ask me, this, this is typifies what the selection process for uh, saying, subject to extreme pressure, physical, mental, emotional, all kinds, and then see your reaction. So this is the typical reaction. So if you ask me, this guy, this gentleman who did that activity is a classic SF hopeful, mm. right? And this is exactly, you, you blow this up into a hundred such different scenarios across a 90 day period where stress is induced and seed delivery happening, mm. multiple situations. So could you take us through what happens when you actually go and begin work on the field? Like um, in terms of when I spoke to uh, Major Jacob, he highlighted how you guys are trained to be in different terrains. And that's also probably an edge that the Indian Army has over other armies that we have access to different terrains. So could you take us through this statement a little further in terms of we have jungles, beaches, mountains. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the whole Indian Army is trained to kind of uh, traverse through those situations. But I'm also sure that the Special Forces is sent possibly deeper into these terrains? Well, you're right. And, and Vivek is absolutely right. So the, the diversity in the, the, the kind of terrain and the operating conditions that uh, is offered uh, in the Indian context is phenomenal. Hmm. And there's a lot of, uh, and that's, there's, there's a reason why a lot of foreign armies continuously come and train with us because the kind of exposure that our guys have had hmm. uh, uh, in in different uh, operating circumstances and the uh, the terrain and the um, other uh, situations is not really comparable from the from Siachen, which Raghu has uh, spoken extensively about um, minus uh, 45 minus 60 degrees centigrade uh, operating in those kind of uh, environments altitudes and uh, temperatures to the deserts of Rajasthan, to the jungles of the Northeast, to uh, Andamans and uh, Lakshadweep, uh, amphibious kind of operations. It, there is a huge variety, mm. right? And you, once again, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's not just the spe special forces. It's the entire Indian army that uh, operates in all of these. Uh, so uh, you, you pick up any, any unit of the Indian army, uh, an infantry unit, which is operating in Siachen uh, uh, this year, 
Two years later, it could be in the jungles of the Northeast. Two years later, it could be in, in Rajasthan. So that kind of diversity is available across the Indian Army. But I think uh, the, the difference, the key difference is how these forces are employed. So typically, um, uh, the Indian Army or all armies of the world operates in masses, in numbers, right? So you have a defined structure, uh, the organizational structure. Uh, there is a chain of command there. Uh, there is a, a, a logistic chain that uh, is trained and organized and maneuvered to keep you sustained, mm. right? That's typically how it works. In the special forces, how it operates, however, is that they operate in very small teams. Teams of uh, uh, five men, six men uh, combinations and uh, multiples thereof, right? And that's how they operate. And, and typically, in a typical scenario, uh, the special forces teams are supposed to be dropped behind the enemy lines. So it's not where the typically uh, army to army contact takes place or the, the uh, uh, where, where the action actually takes place, but it's behind enemy lines where you have no sustenance for you. You're you have known. no logistics backup. Hmm. You have just what your set of five guys is carrying with them, period. You cannot be in communication because you are behind enemy lines. Uh, you're bound to be picked up and then, you know, triangulated and uh, your, your identity established and your location established. So you cannot do that. So you're cut off from communication, you're cut off from logistic sustenance, you're, and that's where you need to ensure that every single member of that team is technically proficient, is able to convert efficiency, which they are over a period of time, to effectiveness on ground. Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned that thing right uh, up, uh, uh, up front, that the, the ability to convert efficiency to effectiveness is what actually defines uh, special forces. Uh, so it, it's many of these things that the ability to work under very stressful, very uh, adverse conditions out in the field behind enemy lines where you could be picked up at any point in time. That's the kind of uh, uh, thing that defines the special forces. And that's where camaraderie comes in as well. Mm. Right. Because life and death, these five guys against the entire army. Mm -hmm. Right. And you're in their land. So that's where it, I, I, I'm in, you know, incidentally, do you, have you seen this movie called The Lone Survivor? No, but I do intend on it. It's Mark Wahlberg and uh, it's about <laughs> yeah, Iraq, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's about Afghanistan. Afghanistan, I'm sorry. It's yeah. uh, about a SEAL uh, team that's similar. It's a four-man team that's uh, dropped behind enemy lines as a recon mission and they get into trouble and the, the whole movie, it's a real life story about how they're uh, extracted back and this one guy survives. So it's a beautiful movie. I mean, I could relate to that movie frame by frame because each frame of that movie reminds me of Kashmir. Mm. It's actually like, you know, it's not Afghanistan. It's actually Kashmir. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, so people who haven't seen the movie, uh, it's one movie on Netflix, uh, very strongly recommended. It's a real picture of what a special forces life Absolutely. Is. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think there, there is a great amount of... Uh, uh, identity that I could establish uh, with the terrain, with with the technical proficiency in how the movie is actually captured, uh, in uh, some amount of the tactical stuff that happens on the ground, phenomenal. Um, so, in that five-person team, how do they actually construct the team, and how do they choose a captain or whatever of that unit? So, there's a lot of democratization that happens within that team. Okay. So, once you're in that team, actually. Uh, there is a leader, there is a, a hierarchy that's defined, but it's flattened out. Okay. Right? Because as far as the team is concerned, if there is going to be a vertical hierarchy that is going to be established, that team cannot function. Mm. In fact, uh, let me just step back and say one more very, very interesting stuff about uh, the manner in which the selection is actually carried out uh, in, the, in the Special Forces Probation. So when the probation is carried out, uh, like I said, there is a probation officer, there is a probation NCO, and there are probably two, three soldiers. And then uh, the entire process of uh, probation is carried out, and each of these tests, physical, 
technical, um, mental agility, firing, everything else, everything is put on paper and his performance is kind of mapped and it's a very, very scientific way of doing it. It's everything is uh, brought on paper and then it's put before a board that then sits and decides whether this guy is okay or not. Uh, well, technically the, the commanding officer of the unit has got a veto. He can say yes or no, irrespective of how the others feel, but it's, it's very, very seldom used. Mm. If that person, if the probationer uh, is found to be deficient by anyone on that the thing, so the junior most soldier who can say, Saab, mere ko lagta, Saab, fit hai. So he could be the best uh, fighter, he could be uh, physically, he could be John Rambo. Uh, he could be anything else, right? Uh, technically, he could be proficient. But if that guy feels, and these are all very hardened soldiers, they are combat experienced and uh, solid guys uh, who would not say no just for the heck of it. Mm. He doesn't like him. He doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. For him, what matters is, is this guy capable of going into combat with? If I go, if I'm part of this guy's team, will mm. I come back alive? Mm. That's a question that he applies. Mm. And these 90 days that he sees him stripped bare is enough for him to make up his mind. Mm. So usually everybody is in sync because they, they actually seen the guy through and through the guy. You can wear the best clothes. You can have a, a, an exterior that's primed and polished in this thing like in, on social media. right? But when you go through probation, it's all stripped clean. You're stripped clean to your bones and the essence of your character, the deep recess of your character is fully exposed. And so the democratization that I was talking about, the soldier, the junior most soldier, he's got the right to stand up and say, Saab, mergo nahi lagta, saab fit hai. and he's rejected. So everything that is on paper could say that he is fantastic, but yet there is a gut feel of that soldier who is not comfortable with this Saab being with him on the team. Does that actually happen? It does. Oh, wow. I've seen it in my own unit. I've wow. seen it in my own unit where a guy was phenomenal. His records were just outstanding. And if there was not this, and in that particular case, it was not just one, but two guys who said, mm. sab. I don't think. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in subsequent uh, situations also, people come up and it's, it's not a very uh, regular occurrence, but the odd occurrence takes place where a guy will come up and say, Ki, Saab ka bad luck kharaab hai. Wow. <laughs> so when you say Saab ka bad luck kharaab hai, it means that he attracts fire for no reason. He's not the guy I'm comfortable with going into combat with. Mm. So it could be a technical deficiency. It could be a character deficiency. It could be a physical fitness deficiency. It could be deficiency that's in different forms. But this guy is not going to tell you any of that. He's not going to get technical about it. He just expresses to you that mm. I'm not too happy. Speaking about combat, sir. Um, again, a lot of people have saving uh, Private Ryan as like a reference when it comes to army movies. So other units also constructed with like people with different skill sets, like one sniper, someone who's great at like ambushing, someone who's like a demolitions expert. Other teams constructed in a particular way, depending on the mission like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, there are five uh, what's called the primary skills. Like I, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, in terms of uh, demolitions, communication, navigation, medical, and advanced weapons. So typically, these are these five skills. And when you call a, a team, a five-man team, the rationale is that every single member of the team is, is a master at one of these skills. Got it. And a second guy is, uh, has got a working uh, uh, expertise got it. in all these five. That's how this team is stitched together. What is advanced weapons? Like, is it like futuristic weapons? What is it? The ability to be uh, improvising and utilizing weapons as and when they appear, wherever. So, like I said, you know, it's most of it is, it's constructed to be working behind enemy lines. Mm. So, you, you, you're carrying the weapons that you're carrying, right? But then you may have the ability or the opportunity to be using an op uh, a weapon that the enemy has got mm. or the terrorist has got. Mm. Uh, so, this guy is expected to be proficient in all weapons across 
the world. Mm. The rest of us are proficient in the weapons that we carry. Mm. But this guy, any weapon, anywhere, he can strip clean it and uh, uh, put it back in uh, 45 seconds. It's probably an intuitive skill, right? Some, also. Hmm. Also. Sometimes when I'm talking to special forces personnel, as a viewer, as a, a part of the armed agenda, I have so many movie-like questions. Uh, have you ever gotten injured yourself in an operation? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm one of the guys who who made it uh, out of the uh, out of my service without getting uh, well the odd injury here there, but no no bullet injury. But you've uh, seen it obviously yes, in your team. Uh, very close quarters, so many of them. Are you are you allowed to describe sort of what happens like? So I I had uh, written about. Um, this uh, colleague of mine, a dear friend, uh, Dipinder Sengar, I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, a very, very uh, interesting story. In fact, that's been, uh, uh, and, I, and I wrote this about, I think, six, seven years back. Um, he got shot uh, while uh, we were operating in the Northeast in Assam. And then he recovered and then uh, we went into Kargil and uh, came back from Kargil and then he was shot again. Um, and you know, cumulatively, uh, he had about seven uh, bullets in his body in the space of about uh, three years, two and a half, three years. Wow. Um, and of course, the second time around, uh, the doctors told him that he'll never walk again. And um, how this guy then switched track. He, he of course, could uh, continue in the army, but that's not what he wanted to do. You know, special forces and cutting edge soldier he doesn't want to be sitting behind a desk peddling files. Uh, that's what he would do if he were. So he decided to quit and then he went in uh, from nothing. So he's from the Sainik school, Sainik school Riva. And um, he had nothing in his life other than Forge and then SF. Right? And that's what he did. And at 32, 33 or something like that, uh, he decided that he has to carve out a, a fresh career for himself. He did not know what that was. Um, but he decided to give it a shot. So he asked around. People told him about uh, MBA. MBA karna jururi hai bhai. If you want to, you know. So this guy decided to take the cat. He's prepared for a year. While on the bed, uh, could not walk, could not move. Um, he gave the cat. Uh, he got a call from IM, A, B, C and L. Wow. Went to IMA, talked that place. Came out. Now he's with Microsoft in the US. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, that's an example of special forces yeah, mindset. exactly. Exactly. Being moldable. Absolutely. So the adaptability that you will never, ever give up, no matter what, no matter what circumstance you're thrown into, you will find a way to land on your feet and work your way through, right? And I understand that there's a sense of brotherhood when there's that five-man unit, six-man unit. I've heard this from both Captain Raghu and Major Jacob. I'm sure even you would echo that same thought, sir. So if you see a teammate who's gotten hit, what's the whole mindset of the team? Is there like more anger? Is there protection towards that guy? What's his mindset like when he gets hit? Yeah, of course, there, there, is, there is emotion. It's never easy to see uh, uh, somebody that you're working with. Uh, it's, it's brotherhood, right? I think you use the right term. It's, uh, it's, it binds people in the team stronger than how uh, families are bound. Right. It's, it's a very, very strong, intense binding. And in fact, you know, the, this is the thing. So once I uh, hung up my uniform and transitioned to the, to the corporate world, uh, this is what I've been trying to do. Of course, it's, it's a very, very difficult process uh, because the, the uh, mitigating circumstances in both situations, are, they're completely chalk and cheese, right? totally different. But the operating philosophy is this, that, you know, you look at your own life. Uh, you go out, party with your friends, you enjoy, uh, there's something that brings you immense happiness. That lasts for a week, a month, a year, a couple of years. But 20 years down the line, you might not quite remember that. But if you're put through an excruciating, uh, life-threatening situation with three or four other guys, which has dramatically altered your way, your thinking, uh, it, has, it has pushed you to the brink of uh, um, knowing whether you'd live past this or not. That's something that will not, you will remember every, every uh, instant of that uh, event in chronological sequence 20 years down the line. And that's exactly what this happens. So the, the bottom line is this, that teams tend to do well when they are put through stressful conditions, mm. situations. That's, that's the glue that binds teams together. 
and that glue cannot be shaken off even right? in the corporate world absolutely hmm. absolutely so uh, well uh, let me qualify that uh, like i said the mitigating circumstances are different if that is going to be for a higher cause for a cause larger than just the money that accompanies it yes if it is not i'm not too sure um when you look back at your military career right is there one story that um kind of rings in your head oh, uh, one story <laughs> I, <laughs> i can never bring it down to one story <laughs> what a couple of hundred stories i mean we would love to hear <laughs> you know at least if you could shed light on some of them i think that's something that will stay with the audiences forever yeah, okay so um yeah i mean i so i i told you the story of sengar uh, right and incidentally sengar's story has been picked up by the film world and they converted it into a movie uh, zid ki jeet or something like that uh, quite frankly i i was very uh, upset with the way the characterization has been done and the quality of the thing so if i were to put uh, um, uh, the lone survivor and zid ki jeet on <laughs> <laughs> you know chalk and cheese right? right so here was a beautiful story that it quite did not kind of uh, come across on on uh, on the on the screen the manner that it should have and but anyway um so there there is this uh, this is story that uh, i'd like to share about uh, when i did my probation right so typically the probation uh, is 90 days and on the 89th day there is something called uh, the escape and evasion exercise that scared out this is during training the, the probation hmm. the probation period 90 day period and that's the uh, the culmination so that's the last test so what happens is uh, all the probationers are are broken down into buddy pairs two people and then you're stripped right to ensure that you're not carrying any money with you no water no um, maps um no i mean nothing else except for the clothes that you're wearing uh, so you're stripped down to your underwear and you're checked and then you are allowed to wear your dungarees or your overalls uh, with your shoes and that's it and then you are uh left off from one point and then you have to travel 100 kilometers uh on your feet uh and get to the reporting uh point and there would be ambushes en route which uh, will kind of try and pick you up right so it, it they just they just replicating an escape invasion so you're a prisoner of war in the enemy com- country you were uh, operating with a the team there that you've been picked up and you're prisoner of war and now you are finding a way back from the thing across the border to your own and so there are you know that that's that's the uh, play um uh, you have to make this in 24 hours right you cannot afford to take uh, a lift on a vehicle or anything else which makes uh, immediate uh, uh, expulsion and uh, so that's the thing it's it's a test of your integrity it's a test of your physical fitness it's your test of sense of navigation uh, direction finding and all of that because and you don't even have a compass bro nothing nothing mm. at all so you do astro navigation and you know general the stars general yeah, through the stars general <laughs> line of direction and you know and hope for the best <laughs> um and i'm guessing you climb on trees to like save yourself during for rest like hell no <laughs> you just lie on the ground wow <laughs> you just lie on the ground so this particular incident happened uh, uh, in uh, dehradun uh, where you you trans uh, you transitioning from one side of the valley to the other side of the valley mm. right um so we we went there and, and my buddy <laughs> and me a soldier a simple fellow and uh he came from the maratha light infantry so did i i was in the maratha light infantry earlier so uh, we both started off and then initially full of josh right you running and this thing and, and ensuring that we don't get caught and all of that so you got to have you climb over two mountain ranges and the reporting point is on the other side so we went through all of that and uh, and there was a thunderstorm that night and there's no light uh, and you're climbing up this mountain face uh, with water just belting down uh and you you know holding on to 
dry tufts of grass and, st and branches and stuff like that and climbing. And probably if there was light, you wouldn't climb that way because, you know, it was sheer drop. Mm. But anyway, we climbed and we, 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 we did, I think, about 85, 90 kilometers. And by then I was, I was pooped. Mm. I was, the cumulative effect of 89 days of, uh, of uh, probation related stress, it just got to me. And I just uh, sat down. I, I knew that I couldn't walk a step beyond. And I just sat down there. And somewhere in the distance, I could hear probably three, four, four kilometers away, I could hear a highway kind of this thing. So trucks movement and all light, you could pick up the uh, thing. So I told this guy, I said, Mera aur dam nahi hai. Aur main chal nahi sakta hun. Aisa kar. Ja kar ke jara dekh. Gaadi wadi mil jata hai. Then we'll better get into a vehicle and do whatever. Chhe aart kilometer. And then we'll get off and then last two kilometers we'll somehow make it. We had adequate time up our sleeve. So he told me, Saab, Rehna do Saab. Paidali chalte hai. Nabbe kilometer kar liya na. Abhi rai gya dus kilometer. So kar lete hai. Let's do it. So, you know, your, your mental faculties start degrading. I said, no, 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 go and do it. Because uh, the, the thing about probation is if one of you falters, if you don't make it, just you getting across the line doesn't help. You have to get together as a team, right? So you pay for the mistakes of your buddy. And that, that the underlying principle is when you're in combat operations behind the enemy lines, you need to trust your buddy. And you need to ensure that something that you do, you're going to, the effects of that are going to be felt by the other guy as well, right? So he said, uh, so after a protracted exchange, I'm just, just compressing it. Uh, he told me, nice, sir, ye nahi karunga main. So then I have MC, BC, you know, all <laughs> that, Allah, I am a bloody officer, to Allah, sipahi hai, all of that. And I'm bloody well ordering you, go and drive, stop a vehicle. He loosened up his dangri sat down beside me. He said, Sir, you have to say what you want to say. You have to do what you want to do. No problem, Sir. We will fail. You go to your unit. I will go to my unit. We will not become SF. We will be a job. But we will not do this. And then, uh, the last 10 kilometers, he pushed me, carried me, cajoled me, pulled me, did all that it takes to get me across the finish line. And this is the enduring part. And, and you know, so I have been to his house uh, in Himachal. I have spent uh, uh, two nights there. I have attended his wedding. Uh, these, these, are, these are things that you never forget, right? Mm. <laughs> these are just carry forwards that... Uh, and that the binding is so strong that uh, when you're in a combat operation and the bullets are flying and you're, you know, active firefights, there, is, there are no words exchanged and there are no uh, formal declarations or uh, protocols that are signed. But I know that if I get hit, that this guy, Shamraj is going to pick me up and get me home. I might not be alive, but my body will come back. Mm. And I don't have to tell it to him either. He knows that he will not leave me. So this is the kind of binding that, that is over over uh, continuous exposure to, to stressful combat situations that just binds teams together. And this is not about two people. It's about five people. It's about 10 people. So the camaraderie that exists in a, in a special forces unit far exceeds what happens in a regular unit. Yeah. And what happens in a regular unit far exceeds what happens uh, Daily life. In, in life in general. Yeah. Mm. If I may ask you a story from, you know, the active, uh, an active combat situation. But uh, yeah, so I think I could uh, speak about, and, and I've spoken about this in, in a couple of TEDx talks that I did and all that. Uh, uh, one of the things that stays with me is how unprepared you are for your first real exposure to active fire, right? So you, uh, the amount of firing that we do at the ranges uh, in preparation is just phenomenal. Um, hundreds of thousands of uh, hours of firing, incessant uh, firing that happens. And yet, uh, in that first exposure, your senses get dulled, right? Uh, you know, you're not still operating on, on peak the same because the fact that there is another guy across who's firing back at you with the intent to kill you 
is 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 something that kind of uh, uh, dulls your senses and you take a little bit of time to uh, get accustomed to that so um, this is in in kashmir in uh, kupwara there is this place called the lolab valley lolab inc- incidentally very interesting uh, side story uh, lolab is a small little valley uh, near kupwara uh, near the line of control um the guys in the sf uh, uh, or at least in my unit we used to call it the land of love and beauty l o l a b we made an acronym for it and land of love and beauty because the sweetest apples grow there in the whole of kashmir the girls are the prettiest and the fiercest of militants from across generally come and tend to rest here and typically there's always this uh, this uh, struggle between the sf teams who gets to operate in lolab right so everybody's wine to operate there because land of love and beauty mm. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, it is in lolab and uh, i remember this uh, saying because these two guys uh, were and uh, uh, were my lead scouts so we we go in a certain formation when we are going up um, the hill uh, deep uh, thick jungles and then suddenly uh, from the left Eleven uh, o'clock uh, area, right uphill. There's a burst of fire. Uh, typically, you can make out that it's an AK-47 burst that you know just opened up. And uh, these two guys and these two guys were battle-hardened uh, veterans, right? They've been in a lot of uh, uh, of firefights. For me, this was my first exposure to a live firefight. Although uh, you know this is uh, uh, almost. Um, four years of um, soldiering where you're not uh, seeing and uh, just about i think four months of uh, having completed my probation and getting into the sf so an sf soldier generally is exposed to any amount of fire fights so this was my first and uh, so we you know it, it's i think muscle memory you you lie down and you know get hit the ground and then try in the thing and these guys went about that drill in perfect sequence right they know exactly how to do it and all that and i was behind this uh, there was a fallen tree trunk and i was behind uh, the tree trunk uh, but my entire body was not fully behind it was uh, kind of you know tircha position so a part of me was exposed and then this guy uh, he suddenly gets up uh, puts one hand on my collar and the other hand around my midriff holds my dangri and just flips me <laughs> just using both hands he just flips me across so that i'm coming to the side and for about 30 seconds i don't quite understand what the hell is going on right and it's only then that uh, i understand that this guy actually got up exposed himself to fire he did not en- en- engage me in a conversation because there was so much of activity that was happening dust was getting kicked down and uh, cacophony of the thing fire happening returning fire and all of that uh, rocket launchers going off and all that he just got up and picked me up so he exposed himself and when we got back i asked him well, let me use another uh, uh, name i i just told him lakshman tumne aise kyon kiya why the hell did he do it <laughs> so he smiled and he told me sab karwai dusra hota ulta hota if you were in my position wouldn't you have done it so in that uh, in that 30 second frame he did it out instinctively because he knew that this guy is my team and he can't afford to be hit and he he it did not enter his brain that he could be hit too so and instead of getting into a conversation and that uh, the entire activity happening for 2 minutes he took a 7 second 8 second 10 second uh, exposure to pull me into this end so these are the kind of stuff you know where <laughs> and and it teaches you so many things there are so many managerial uh, management lessons in that right mm. uh, on how to do what to do and and stuff like that uh, maybe if you could highlight another story which would highlight another management lesson <laughs> <laughs> so well, maybe that you learned about leadership through action so um from my earliest childhood uh, memories i was always a kind who would have these uh, uh, fears of falling you know 
of um, a dark uh, deep hole that it's got no reference point and you're just falling you know there's no context it's just that somehow in, in your conscious subconscious you're just falling and um, uh, you know you you wake with a start uh, suddenly um, and um, and you realize that if you know everything is good you're safe and stuff like that so i you there was no rationale to it i would have these uh, these uh, nightmares on on a recurrent basis and it just happened through my uh, younger days uh, through adolescence and uh, teenage years and all of that and then i volunteered for the sf and um, <clears throat> completed my probation i had gone for the for my para basic um, the parachute jumping uh, thing so um, i remember this uh, incident so well it was in october 95 and i was standing uh, inside an an32 aircraft with the 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 rear ramp of the aircraft fully pulled out and you're standing at the edge you're, you're the first guy to be jumping and there are line of 10 guys behind you soldiers and youngsters from my unit and so the typical how how it works is the the uh, an32 is a military transport aircraft and it's like a think about it as a tin uh, can right and there are seats on both sides facing inwards mm. right and the rear ramp operates like this so when the, when the when the stick is ready to be thrown out of the aircraft people who are jumping it's called a stick uh, so there's 10 12 14 people so one side gets up faces out towards the rear of the aircraft and there is a jump master who is standing there and controlling the entire activity and there's a red light and a green light in front Uh, so when the pilot is ready, he aligns the aircraft over the drop zone, and then he gives the red changes to green, and the green is the indication for you to jump. So I'm standing at the edge of this aircraft, uh, holding onto my parachute, you know, and looking down, and it's uh, this is the greatest fear that I've known all my life, right? The fear of falling, and I'm standing here and I'm wondering. I mean, these questions have come to me even earlier, but now it's now you know you're on ground zero, right? You you're at the edge of the aircraft and you have to jump. And that uh, in your deep recess in your mind is that question: Should should I? Karna hai kya? And then I look uh, across the aisle to the other side of the aircraft where the other line of fifteen uh, twenty uh, young paratroopers are sitting, my unit. and those guys each one of them is looking because it's the first experience for everybody all of us have done the basic course and we is coming and the first jump for everybody and he is looking at me into my eyes and i know then that if i hesitate now or if i show the slightest sense of hesitation this guy is never ever going to take me as a leader never ever right so if i hesitate now Ten years down the line, if I'm to take this guy out into combat, if I say that's the Pakistani's post up there, let's go. He's not going to go. He's not going to move, right? So that that was the only connection that was there. And then I I looked at them, looked back. The green light came, and I jumped. There was no hesitation. So some of these things, you know, it it plays on your mind. It kind of uh, activates that trigger and that trigger is not something that can be uh, uh, justified or uh, cannot be expressed there is a certain mental level and there are there are trip wires there that are um, uh, just hanging there and you do quite don't know where that trip wire is but it's that external trigger that uh, is caused that makes you cross those uh, those uh, lines Once you jumped, what was in your head? Once you nothing, falling? because once you jumped, because the you see the this is another story that every paratrooper will tell you. the The first jump is not the scariest, actually. So just give context on what paratrooper is. Okay, a paratrooper is a guy. Okay, the the smart guys are the ones who fly the aircraft. The paratroopers are the stupid guys who jump out. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. so uh, all all special forces soldiers are paratroopers mm. and then there are regular paratroopers also who are not special forces but are regular paratroopers mm. so paratroopers are generally guys who are delivered into battle from air mm. so you use a para- parachute to descend into battle that's the definition of a paratrooper you were you were saying something about jumping out yeah so the first jump is uh, although i was scared shitless you know the first jump but the second jump was even worse 
and this is something that applies e equally uh, people might not be the braver ones may not be as scared as i was uh, but the second jump is is uh, more worrisome is more scary because you now you know the sequence of what happens once you exit <laughs> the first time is just theory right <laughs> so somebody has told you aise hoga aise hoga ye khulega wo khulega ye the second time you know exactly what the sequence the slip stream hits you you go into this thing and the panic and oh god khulega nahi khulega that can that happens yeah yeah it does but it's a very very safe activity in fact uh, it's safer than crossing the average street in delhi mumbai mm. uh, so paratrooping and soldiering very safe activity mm. um did you ever have any interactions with wild animals yes uh, um a number number of them uh some of them are bearded and uh, carry weapons from across <laughs> the line of control but uh, the four legged variety is also <laughs> uh honestly i'd love to hear about both kinds <laughs> but uh let's go with whichever one you pick yeah um so this is very very interesting uh so a story about uh, my own unit um so there's a officer in our unit from the northeast right so um fantastic well decorated officer uh daredevil so just a bit bit of context here before i uh, give the story is that uh, in the uh, in the army in general the commander of a of a unit sub unit is called tiger whoever is the senior most or the established leader is called tiger so that's on your radio set and uh, even otherwise it's it's referred to as tiger so the commanding officer of the unit is a tiger the company commander is a tiger there are four companies in a unit in a battalion so each company commander is a tiger of his particular outfit then there are platoon commanders one rung below so the entire hierarchy so each each of these uh, each of these sub sub units has got a uh, leader who's referred to as a tiger so we <laughs> we were it is snowbound uh, in kashmir uh, place near tandar um ahead of kupwara very close to the line of control in fact almost on the line of control so we were out on a mission we were climbing this mountain and uh, we were in uh, let's say about at least 3 to 4 feet of uh, standing snow wow so it was uh, very hard uh, very steep incline and the standing snow doesn't make it uh, uh, easy at all so we were struggling and uh, it ex exacts a tremendous amount of your strength right so uh, this guy this this manipuri officer uh, was in the lead and um, so suddenly you can make out on the radio set because that's a distance and in the night right uh, so he he said halt wait quiet uh, the thing on the radio set so you suddenly take position because that's the classic this thing of there is some trouble ahead or there is he picked up some movement that requires investigation or he suspects something happening and all that so <laughs> so he say, and then there's there's quiet because then you don't get into conversations right we everybody is just silent and observing and your hearing and your eyesight and everything you get out your night uh, binoculars and stuff like that and you you're trying to identify what where so you don't ask any questions so you don't get into a, a speech on the thing because everybody just want to keep all their peripheral senses working over time so there was a period of quiet for about uh, probably a couple of minutes i guess and then there was absolute pin drop silence right and uh, so then some somebody on the set asked him oi kya hua so he says tiger hai so this guy says tiger to mere sath mein hai he says abbe wo wala tiger nahi char wala tiger so that there, there's a, a snow leopard out there and it, it they're in face to face so that guy is also wondering what the hell is this guy doing out here mm. so you know and then uh, there was about 20 minutes of uh, of uh, an extreme situation because you never know it's a, it's a cat in the wild right and snow leopards are way bigger than people think That's yeah 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 it is it is it is so then there was a quiet for about the thing no movement everybody was just frozen and then 
after some time we could pick up on the uh, on the night vision that the outline of the thing that guy had also halted so there was a there was a face off for about a, a couple of minutes and then the guy decided to break contact and go so under moonlight and it was a i guess it was a half moon or something like that the the beauty of nature right and uh, that people go to such great extents to see seeing it in the wild was an amazing uh, experience yeah. fantastic experience like any uh, what's it called wildlife photographer would have killed to oh yeah that. absolutely <laughs> absolutely and virgin snow right absolute yeah. virgin snow and this guy on a perch uh, Right was there. was there ever sense of okay it's go it might pounce out of yeah of course okay so the 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 guy who was about uh, probably ten uh, fifteen feet away from or probably lesser uh, more I don't know uh, a couple of uh, feet away from that that guy was like and he you know we're calling him on the set and he's not answering I also want the audience to keep in mind that you guys were fully loaded with weapons probably yes 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 but absolutely. there's still a daunting absolutely element and of we, that. So we have our weapons loaded. The round in the chamber, the the lead scout, and the officer, they have their weapon on uh, off safety. So you know you, the, the first fire. reaction can be in milliseconds, right? Mm. So all three of them have this thing. So the, the rest of the team generally has their safety on. So you need to switch off the safety, and then only you can fire. Mm. but uh, the rest of the, the 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 scouts and the first officer they always have uh, their weapons on ready so they can fire but then again you know you don't want to involve yourself in this unless you're there's a direct attack on you or something like that that becomes the thing because these are these are magnificent beasts and uh, endangered species and you know the ability or your the opportunity to actually see them at such close quarters beautiful so it just stared down Yeah, 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 and that's it. For that's like a it. minute, it was just staring. And then decided, oh yeah, the SF wale are not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the kind of vibe you get from that magnificent wild animal? And I'm dead sure that's not the only wild animal you've seen. You might have seen probably bears or something also on your. Yeah, no, not me personally. This is oh. my uh, only experience with a right. with a four legged wild animal. What did you pick up from like seeing it there in terms of? Uh, I mean, well, uh, at that point in time, the thing was more whether will it attack? Will I mean, what do you do? So constantly, the thing that's running on your mind is if something were to happen, how do you react? What do you do? You know, so and and that's that's something that uh, we are trained to be doing, right? Uh, so when you are walking, uh, and a lot of my friends make fun of me you know, now, even now. So when, even when you go to a restaurant, uh, you sit in a restaurant. you want to be scanning the environment you want to be seeing who's where who is what somebody doing where is the exit so the first thing that i do and many of my uh, colleagues and you know friends in the sf do is that when you reach some place you identify the exit first what are the alternate exits what are the ways to get there who's who's where so your general awareness it's it's a it's a mind mapping that happens almost uh, instinctively Mm. you know you map this and this there's this it's fed into the background and then you get on with whatever else you're doing drinking or mm. eating or whatever else are the terrorists also well trained of course are, they are. Are, are they at your level of like well um technical proficiency might certainly not uh, be i mean well i'm talking of the average joe i'm not talking of uh, there are uh, outliers on all of these uh, so, but te- technical proficiency will be pretty low mm. right but it more than makes up for their uh, the ability to give up one's life got it right the That's the, the, the motivation got it the motivation levels are are different right so uh from that point of view i think it's it's you need to be giving the devil his due uh, mm. and you need to be aware and you need to be prepared that here is a bloke who doesn't mind giving up his life and then you need to be prepared to be de- dealing with that that eventuality something i've low key picked up from both you and major jacob and captain raghu for that matter is that the army teaches you to read human beings very quickly like if you're interacting with someone outside the army you can pretty much scan that person i don't understand how you all do it but i can see that you all do it i i should be honest with you that i don't think i know the science behind it but i think you're right that you know uh, on a very intuitive level uh, you learn to pick up uh, whether this guy is 
what is this guy about uh, i think uh, on a, but i i don't know the science behind it yeah honestly don't know the science behind it do you want to hear it from a layman's perspective sure uh whenever i ask an army man anything about anything um you guys describe it in a lot of detail so i think it's it's primarily your observational powers that's the muscle that gets worked in your training uh this observational power doesn't get worked in any other industry to some extent now i because i teach communication skills in my videos i'm forced to do the same uh at at a certain point i switched from fitness content to like communication skills content my lens of the world changed for the sake of my writing but you guys have to do it as a part of your job like right from day one um, um well uh, that that's uh, actually news to me um, probably you are right and not probably i think you certainly are right but uh, i think i need to uh, you know to to think a little deeper about this uh, uh, because i really haven't applied myself in on that level but you're right uh, observational thing you we we do we do tend to scan the environment and categorize people on a, on a very subconscious level right yeah 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 not yeah. not in a judgmental way just like it gets worked out right so. right coming back to the wild animal conversation sir um i'm sure you've had like you know close encounter with say a terrorist so from a human being's breakdown what do you think is there in the terrorist head is it like completely rewired is there like nothingness what are they thinking about well uh, like they say the only good terrorists is a dead terrorist right so and that's the principle that we operate with in the sf that you know uh, but there, there are occasions where a guy puts up his hands and you know uh, decides to surrender and then you know then the the rules of engagement changes so uh, a humane approach is is always centric <clears throat> so having said that uh, there there are uh, there are instances when we have interacted uh, uh, with people who have put up their hands or decided not to the one of the striking things that comes very clearly through is the sense of indoctrination clearly they have been fed bullshit right but the bullshit has been fed in such such a precise and a very concise and uh, Uh, with intent that that's his altered reality that he his reality has completely changed the frame has changed completely for him and therefore his belief system is altered in a manner that that propels him drives him to do irrational things uh, because he believes that uh, you know 72 virgins waiting in heaven for him or or it's an heuristic equivalent uh, that have been force fed into him over, over a period of time so to deconstruct that is not a is not a very uh, easy process because to de-radicalize him uh, a guy who's gone that extent to get him back into the thing is a, i'm not saying is impossible but it is an extremely difficult uh, uh, process because uh, at some form it has touched his soul it has mm-hmm. touched his inner uh, inner uh, 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 systems right and he he uh, is vibrating to that uh, uh, altered reality mm-hmm. so to realter that altered reality is not a very easy process uh, and i believe it's not a very uh, uh, sustainable process either mm-hmm. so it's it's a difficult uh, proposition you spoke about terrain you spoke about where you saw the snow leopard could you describe like one the most beautiful place you've seen on any of your adventures as a part of the special forces and two the most difficult terrain that you've come across with the most challenging uh well from uh, let's let's tackle the beautiful part of it first uh a lot of people who speak to me about uh about uh gulmarg and sonmarg and you know all these pieces and how beautiful it is i really feel for them <laughs> right because they haven't seen the beauty so um uh, in uh, the uh, uh what's the name of the place so this place is uh, called indrabhek it's called ib right it's very close to the line of control and i can i recall that a couple of my friends uh, uh you know my, or my ex colleagues who uh, been with me there and we just we just go gaga over that place i haven't seen such such beauty in its 
raw, pristine form, even in the best uh, pictures of Austria and uh, Switzerland, and uh, it's just hauntingly beautiful. It's just hauntingly beautiful. The sad part is that uh, at least 99.9995% of our population can never get there. Mm. Right? And probably that's why the beauty is still being preserved. That's, mm. that's the other side of the story. But uh, it's hauntingly beautiful. Covered in, in it's, it's a typical postcard that you see from Switzerland and Austria and one of these uh, flyers that you see. Amazingly beautiful. No wonder the Pakis want it so badly. Mm. It's beautiful. It's just hauntingly beautiful. And I, we spent so many nights out there uh, just on the, on the fresh snow, on the virgin snow. And just lying up there, night sky, just looking at it and just in, uh, in wonderland, right? Mm. Because the sky is so beautiful. No pollution, absolutely zero pollution. And uh, the, the sights around, and uh, this was before uh, uh, mobile phones and uh, digital cameras and all <laughs> had actually made, uh, imploded the way it has. Uh, but uh, it's, the frames are there in the mind. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I can't replicate them on digital space. No, no. Um, and what about the most difficult? Well, difficult, uh, Cargill, uh, for example, uh, brutal terrain. Had you taken Really part? brutal, brutal terrain. No, not me personally, but my team has, has been there. Mm. But uh, uh, um, the Northeast, um, it, it's another form of uh, difficult terrain, right? The jungles of, uh, of Assam, uh, of Mizoram, is terrible, is really... Uh, it's energy sapping. It it just kills you uh, in a completely different format, right? It's like because it's hot. It's very hot. It's very humid, mm. extremely humid. It's mm. energy sapping completely. Mm. In fact, uh, if it's okay with you, Ranveer, I'll 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 recount a, a story. You know, it's a beautiful story. Please, I'll go for it. So, uh, sometime in the uh, mid '90s or was it late '90s, '97, '98, uh, or somewhere around that time frame, uh, is when the U.S. Uh, special forces, the Green Berets, and we started this uh, this uh, number of cross trainings. So they would come across one of their uh, detachments. They call them ODAs, Operational Detachment Alpha, uh, of the Green Berets. They would come down and train with us. One of our teams would go uh, out there and train with them. So the uh, the idea was that uh, to increase the interoperability between the special forces because, you know, it was a more a strategic thing of developing uh, competence and capability in a, in a larger time frame. Mm. So it started somewhere in the mid, uh, late 90s. And I remember one of these uh, things, uh, ODA 152 uh, from Osaka. Uh, I'm sorry, from Okinawa in Japan. So these guys had flown in. And, uh, and that was the first time that our guys had got, when I say our guys, I'm, I'm talking of the average soldier. They had got exposure to be dealing with uh, the SF, uh, the, the American Special Forces. And it's, uh, it's true, typically many of them, a large proportion of them are all beefcakes, mm. right? Very well built and, you know, really muscular and uh, visually they're they are very imposing. And the fact that they have a lot of technology. At those times, I remember uh, these guys used to have these very natty little briefcase-like uh, stuff. And they'd open it out and a small antenna would flip out and uh, they would be on SATCOM with uh, the thing, their base in Okinawa or uh, uh, in, in the US, right? Sitting in the middle of nowhere, in Mizoram, in, in, in the jungles in uh, this place, in, in Assam, they would have rapid connectivity. So both from a, from a visual standpoint, their personality and their this thing, and from the technology that they were bringing in, their weapon systems and all that, uh, it was, uh, it was intimidating for our guys, right? So our guys are typical Ram or Sham hmm. from the, the, the village stock, right? And uh, who uh, typically scrawly, uh, you know, lean and mean, no, no, um, no meat and muscle on them, but very uh, extremely enduring. Their uh, endurance is uh, power is phenomenal. And they were uh, in awe of these guys, you know, the, the first time Gori Chamdi 
and uh, technology and uh, beefcake uh, like personalities and all that there's a there's a little bit of intimidation that was happening <laughs> i could read it in their eyes you know that these guys are wow so uh, over a period of time you break eyes and you start interacting and you're you're firing together you're, you're training together and all of that so the, these uh, training modules are generally about 4 uh, to 6 weeks and uh, about 80% of the time you are doing uh, classroom based training when i say classroom based in the open uh, there are no structures or rooms uh, but it's all in, out in the open uh, but it's squad post training right uh, familiarity with each other's weapons their procedures and stuff like that that's that's how we did and then it ultimately uh, uh, rolls up to a field exercise right where the training is put together they formed into teams and they go through a field exercise a tactical exercise so we went through the training and all people started getting a little more comfortable with each other and you know all of that and then um, we went in for this uh, field exercise where it was uh, a 72 hour operation so there were five or six such teams that were formed each of them about six eight guys and they were left out into the thing this was in in mizoram the jungles of mizoram and uh, <clears throat> um so they are self contained and once again you know it's small teams operating behind enemy lines that's the 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 scenario and when they go out uh, they are self contained so they carry their water they carry their sustenance for whatever 72 hours 96 hours something like that and these guys uh they all carried their chocolate bars and energy bars and you know uh Uh, mineral water and stuff like that but you know it can it can last only for so many so many hours and uh, we went out and uh, the first 24 hours went by the 48 hours went by and about 48 between 48 to 60 hours they ran out of their chocolate bars and they're this thing because it's energy sapping right and the water and this thing they it, it just dries up your body and that's when our ram and sham they would pick out their jungle hats and the same stream in which uh, you know buffaloes are bathing or <laughs> you know uh, the all insects in the sink they would just flip the water to one side and uh, strain out through a, a kapda uh, into their water bottles and pop in a, a water cleansing tablet in that and drink no problem whereas our man when the once the his uh, mineral water is uh, is run dry or his chocolate bars are up and he apna ram and sham can operate with that sukha puri and uh, khasta puri and uh, mirch ka ek uh, sing and uh, whatever something like that he can operate there, there are no problems and then 72 hours to 96 hours later many of these guys had to be picked up and brought back wow so that is the resilience of our average soldier and this is not true only for the special forces infantry units are, and you know our guys are very very hardy extremely hardy extremely resilient and uh, can take punishment of the kinds that other uh, people cannot yeah. cannot endure captain ragu spoke a lot about siachen uh, on the show he also said that there is way more intense places than siachen siachen is the considered the mainstream intense place so what are some of these like examples of these places it does is you know operating in kargil also brutal you mentioned kargil as a pretty brutal terrain but what is the brutality of it brutality well um, uh, ragu is right uh, the siachen is hyped up is hyped up probably for good reason maybe with intent probably by default you know either end of the spectrum uh, and there's a lot of uh, romanticizing that happens uh, associated with the name because you know there there is a certain element of uh, uh, of recollection right that happens when you mention a name but you take any of these uh, this uh, of these areas in in the forward areas right uh, the galwan uh, incident that happened uh, the northern uh, edge of uh, pangangso the lake the terrain there is very harsh extremely harsh right uh, the it's it's almost similar to siachen except you know you don't have that kind of snow snow doesn't fall there but the temperature and the chill uh, wind chill factor is similar if not uh, probably a little worse out here 
the ability to be able to withstand those climatic conditions and uh, operate be able to operate in that kind of an environment is very taxing on the body right and uh, uh, the the logistics and the operational issues that go into uh, turning over the troops in contact with the enemy you know uh, enemy facing uh, thing is humongous is just absolutely humongous I don't know if you recall, um, and I had written a piece on this. Uh, I think it was in the Mumbai Mirror. Um, uh, Hanuman Tapa. Do you re recall that story of that uh, young boy um, who had got trapped in a right. avalanche? Right. Yeah. yeah. Vague. And uh, he was pulled out about, um, uh, I think, six days, five, five days or six days later. Mm. Um, and he was he was still alive. Uh, brought him back, but uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Imagine the kind of effort that it takes to to be working under those conditions, right? Uh, a single helicopter that goes up can carry no more than one jerry can of fuel. Fuel is the lifeline, right? You have about a hundred and twenty uh, guys from the same from Hanumanta Pass uh, company of that particular unit that go in and are digging with their hands. Uh, uh, boulders the size of this room probably, blue eyes, right? Going at it with hammers until more specialized equipment could be flown in because, you know, like I said, a helicopter can lift just one jerry can equivalent of, uh, of load. Uh, that's about 20 liters of fuel. And the kind of stuff that is required to be put together to get the, the entire uh, sustenance operations that uh, go, the logistic chain that goes through to, to keep those 120 guys intact right phenomenal it's just phenomenal it's and it's only the army or the navy or the air force that can that can carry out something like this to just get those 120 people to risk their life because it's still an avalanche prone area 10 of their guys are buried down under right they don't get any esops they don't get any additional pay they don't get any pf additional nothing it's just the fact that one of their own is buried there and they need to pull him out. And they just put everything into it. Right? At the cost of losing another 20 men, 30 men, it, it'll do whatever it takes to get that one guy out. The chances of, of one person uh, staying alive uh, three hours after an avalanche reduces by about 50%. Right? From three hours to nine hours, that reduces to about 85%. So it's only a 15% chance that you'd find him alive. And yet, pumping in 120 guys who are volunteers, each one of them is a volunteer, to go there and dig and actually extract him, that calls for something. So that, that's that's a kind of uh, effort, that's a kind of, uh, of intensity with which uh, people work. And it's such a pity that, you know, the guys are not... Uh, and yet, it's the same, uh, same guy who, when he comes out of the army, is just employed as a guard. Standing outside. That's it. That that's the extent of his uh, of his capability that is recognized by the world outside. Yeah. Uh, Want to highlight two things before we move on to the next question. The first is that we need the listeners of the podcast who've listened to it till this point to share this particular piece. Um, what Sir is saying will kind of happen through your effort. Podcast spread by. Uh, word of mouth and uh, I, I kind of one of the intentions with uh, starting this podcast was to change culture fortunately I have friends like Manish Pandey a common friend he's very driven about rebranding the Indian army so he was someone who nudged me to do these army style podcasts and I've enjoyed it because that's the second thing I want to highlight my second uh, main point that I'd like to bring across is as a podcaster your job is to deep dive into someone else's head and now deep dived into like more than 100 success, so-called successful people's heads, you know, what society considers successful. And whenever I speak to army personnel, there's a very different energy. There's a different approach about life. There's like a very meticulous approach about life. Like as in, if you're given a task, you will break it down to more than the ABCs of things. I think the average efficient human being breaks it down to the ABCs. You guys will go to the core of even what's within the A, the ABCs of just the A and the ABCs of just the B. So uh, that skill can be translated into any industry, basically. Uh, and it's it's a very useful skill for the startup world, for the corporate world, where, um, okay, then that, that's the other thing about the army. You guys are also very action-oriented. 
so you won't just break down the abc's of the abc's but you'll break it down for making your process a lot easier for the whole team there's a again the teammate mentality this efficiency mentality i think it will slowly get discovered by the masses even with this podcast we have people from big corporates who follow the show we have you know entrepreneurs who follow the show and these kind of people need to leverage what indian army veterans have like learned through their career so i personally see it changing so it's just about taking the voice out there i do so too i do so i completely agree I, it's a well i think it's a, there is a, a time dependency here right and uh, uh, podcast such as yourself and you know a whole lot of other uh, such engagements help to bring this this feature to light yes sir and uh, it, it's an education in a in a slightly different dimension right yeah. that uh, there is this uh, this uh, uh, quantity that is available uh, mm. that represents a certain quality and uh, um, you might as well uh, try and take a look at it you know how did you figure okay that your time with the special forces is now up and now it's time for a new innings in life like what was your mindset back then yeah uh, transitions are always difficult right uh, it's always difficult you you uh, you are in a certain comfort zone you are uh, um, confident of what you're doing uh, there is a certain uh, uh, mindset that's been shaped over time uh, so all of that right uh, i'm just reminded uh, so i got this cousin of mine who's uh, much like yourself he's an entrepreneur and he's done very well in life uh, extremely successful so he switched uh, uh, from uh, he was a very successful it uh, entrepreneur he set up his own company and uh, scaled it to amazing heights and then uh, he shifted focus about a, i think about a decade back 8 9 years back uh, he's an engineer and a uh, mba he shifted focus completely he got a ceo to be running the company uh, hands on on a day on day to day basis and he switched over to uh, uh, to genetics uh, to biotech wow. uh, and stuff like that right and this is just around the time when the the um reading of the the genome genome sequencing had just mm. about started right this is the time that he switched and he he was so enamored by the entire thing and you know, and he's now set up his own this is uh, like 5 years ago this is about yeah probably slightly more not 5 years back yeah. uh, if i remember right uh, well i won't i won't have that a guess <laughs> <laughs> because that would be out of my depth so uh-huh. i won't i won't has it a guess there but anyway uh, so a very successful guy so we were ha- and we very close so we have this regular conversation so whenever he flies in from the states we would hook up and you know catch over a couple of drinks and just speak about left right and center so i think uh, it was in uh, early 2002 or thereabouts so one of these conversations he had just flown in and uh, we were having a drink and he asked so what's happening with you so i said i'm in Uh, Kashmir so he said uh, so he asked me what i'm doing and i try and tried and describe it and <laughs> to him in some shape and form uh, so he said okay so have you thought about a life beyond the army i said life beyond the army so he asked okay so what are you doing after this where do you go so i said i've uh, i i should be going in for my staff college uh, exam and uh, then hopefully get to do the staff course uh, i don't know if you heard about the staff course the different services staff college in uh, wellington in nilgiris uh, that's supposed to be the stepping stone for uh, higher appointments in the army okay so i said I, i hopefully i should clear the exam and go for the staff course and thereafter i said okay then what then i said you know couple of years i'll be good to command my unit I'll become a full colonel command my unit he said then what i said then what So that's when he asked me he said, have you ever thought about life beyond the army I said no not really he said why 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 can't you think of I mean you did this for 10 12 years whatever why don't you think of something beyond the army so i said look uh, it's a it's a stable lifestyle it's a it's a secure environment and you know So he said you're in Kashmir uh, you are out in operations probably 6 uh, to 12 times in a year uh, and uh, that's what you intend to be doing for the this thing and each time you go out there 
you're putting your life on the line. There's a risk to your life. So you're telling me that you're willing to take a risk on your life, but not willing to take a risk of stepping out and do something different. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, not because I wanted to do something else. But I said, you know, <laughs> despite all of this, what I'm doing, my little world is just this. And I'm not really able to comprehend or fathom what lies outside that little bubble. And I thought that, that was a little, it, it kind of shook me up. And, uh, and then I thought, you know, I must start thinking about uh, uh, life beyond. Uh, serving the army, uh, serving the country is a privilege. Uh, it's a fantastic experience that I've had so far, but why not? And that's, that's when the Kira first entered my mind. I won't call it a Kira, but... <laughs> Um, so after I finished command of my unit and, uh, I thought, and although I was doing very well in the army, uh, I thought this is an appropriate time because my kids were also coming of the age when they were getting into the 10th and 12th standard. And I could never be there with them when they were navigating their way through then. But I thought, you know, now I should give them a little time and opt for some stability. So these were the kind of factors that played in my mind, uh, you know, when I when I decided to make that switch. It wasn't uh, a comfortable decision at all. And there was a lot of soul searching that went in. Uh, and a lot of my course mates actually told me, Tersa bada gada nahi hai. You know, because you, <laughs> you've done all the all the hard work, right? Uh, or to use their term, they said, Ghutne gise hai tumne. And now it's time to, you know, enjoy the privileges. But uh, I thought, you know, you, there had to be a balance somewhere in life, right? You can't just be going on the path. Well, that's, that's how it appealed to me. So many of these factors just came to play. And I thought, you know, now is a, a reasonable time to having served the army for 21 years to step out and do something different and see uh, how the world outside operates. Mm. And probably be an example for the rest of the army. I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> a lot of my uh, youngsters on my team and, you know, outside will say, oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, not everyone, but I'm sure there's, you know, that uh, maybe there are certain people in the army who are considering that life outside. And there's a lot of value to be added to that world outside. I can at least talk for the startup space in India people in the startup space would readily lap up people from the army once they get to know about the brains uh, that are available. Certainly. Uh, I, I think, the, like, I mean, probably at the cost of reputation, but like I said, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, latent talent that's available. And I, I identify that as idle capacity, mm. right? And um, let's take this pandemic, for example, right? It's, it's about... Uh, the ability to sit down and think through and see how things are going to roll a couple of weeks down the line, a couple of months down the line, a couple of years down the line. And being able to uh, put in place uh, processes and systems to be done. And the, uh, the average uh, uh, army officer is very well trained to be doing that. Mm. that that's his bread and butter. Mm. And so much of competence, so much of, uh, of um, uh, expertise that has been picked up along the way, it's just, just rotting away with uh, people not being able to exploit it. So, so if you had to highlight like the difference in mindset of an average person who's not gone through the whole army experience versus someone who has, what are the advantages here which apply to the corporate world, to the startup world, to even the world of leadership and motivation training, you know? Uh, what can the army actually bring to this world? Well, I, I really won't generalize it to say that, you know, these are uh, uh, two separate buckets, right? And there, there's a lot of overlap that happens, right? Uh, it's essentially a question of, uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way, that there are two or three things that actually stand out, right? Number one is that are people able to correlate and identify with a larger cause, in the army, in the special forces uh, uh, specifically, and in the larger army as well, there is a cause that you're, you're uh, uh, fighting for, that you, you're serving, right? And the ability to paint that picture at the, at, the, at the strategic leadership level, whether it be in the army or the corporate world, to paint that picture that this, we are actually part of a larger cause, right? It's not just the greenbacks or the, or the, the money, the, the cash flow alone that counts. It's an important uh, part. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that 
you know, cash doesn't play a, a part of it at all. It's an important part, but that ability to correlate it with uh, a larger cause, and this is something that you know, the likes of uh, of uh, um, Bezos and um, uh, Elon. Microsoft and yeah, Elon Musk and all these guys have been able to paint that uh, the the larger picture and the ability to gravitate people towards that cause and be part of the process that drives that change. Mm. Right. And that's, that's, I think, a, a very, very important process. So if you've been uh, wearing the olive greens in your earlier avatar or, or the, uh, the whites and uh, uh, the blues for my uh, Navy and Air Force counterparts, there's an alignment there that automatically kicks in. So they know that the alignment can. So you don't need to paint that picture for them. Got it. The ability to correlate that is very is much easier. Got it. But having said that, uh, it would be an insult to the intelligence of so many of our youngsters and so many of our people out there uh, to say that they require specialized training in that. These are all very instinctive. These mm -hmm. are all very intuitive. So a, a person will very quickly catch on if there is a if there is a feeling that this is a cost beyond. Right. A, a larger uh, cause that's being uh, that's that we're working towards, uh, but also uh, uh, probably on a counterintuitive process uh, is also the fact that uh, uh, there there are ways to channel that energy, right? Uh, now it need not necessarily be that uh, uh, you you have uh, uh, a certain. Uh, Microsoft or a, or a Amazon or a Google that needs to come together and paint that picture. It, this intuitive process, you know, is bottom up rather than a top driven, or let's say it, it should meet somewhere uh, uh, midway. God. It's like basically they kind of bring that team player spirit. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. And I don't know if you've read this uh, book, uh, uh, Team of Teams. No, I haven't. It's a brilliant book. It's about the armed forces. No, it's it's about uh, it's about how teams, small teams, and he's just picking up the uh, uh, the idea of the special forces, which operate on small teams, and uh, he's he's talking about a, a situation in a VUCA world where uh, the the basic premise changes so dramatically and so rapidly that you need these small teams to be collaborating with each other and not drive teams so large hmm. that they fail to start functioning uh, yeah. together. Which is the big problem I see in the corporate world, at least from the outside, that it's not agile. That's why there's room for so many startups to come up in this country today. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, this is once again, uh, I don't remember, I think it was in uh, Malcolm Gladwell in Outliers. So he, he talks about this, that typically the moment a team size exceeds somewhere about 150 or so, then you're no longer... Uh, you're sacrificing uh, efficiency. Uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. You're sacrificing uh, creativity for efficiency. Mm. You you are efficient, but you're killing creativity yeah, yeah. because teams don't collaborate. Mm. You know, the, mm. the team becomes so ungainly or unwieldy mm. that they have no ability to be a transaction or everything is actually on a transactional level. Yeah, yeah. Right? <sighs> Colonel Subhan Balakrishnan, I feel like that there's maybe like 10 more podcasts in you. But maybe for this episode, we should just stop it here. Leave the audience with, you know, just a trailer about everything you bring to the table. I also feel the world of the internet hasn't discovered all of you yet. So this is just the first piece. So some uh, signing off note, like from you, like just for the world or the, just for the listeners who've heard the podcast till this point, something about the army. Well, uh, the army is a fabulous organization. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, one of the... Uh, one of those organizations which, uh, if I'm given a chance, and it probably sounds dramatic, but uh, uh, given a chance, it's an organization I'd love to serve with once again, mm. right, going into the future. Um, I don't see too much of a chance happening uh, in this lifetime because I think I've run my course. But uh, probably, you know, uh, it's, it's a beautiful organization. Mm. It's structured so uh, phenomenally well. And... Uh, it's been uh, an organization that has delivered time and time again, right? When every single, take this pandemic, for example, when everyone's back was to the wall, the clamor that started is let's give it out to the army mm. and they will bring it back on track. Mm. 
when the bridge in Matunga was it or where did it collapse on that that uh, um, foot over bridge in uh, on the railway tracks? It collapsed. They brought in the army. See as well. So it, you know it's it runs again and again and again because there is a set there's a belief system, and uh, uh, which which ensures that you are able to to consistently deliver, uh, dip, irrespective of the uh, circumstances around you. Reliability. Well, adaptability, hmm. flexibility. Hmm. <laughs> Ten more podcasts with you, sir. <laughs> Thank you for being on the Ranvi show today. Thank you, Ranvi. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm glad, sir. Again, just the beginning. Just the beginning with this one. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was our episode with Colonel Subin Balakrishnan. If you enjoyed it, make sure you like it. Make sure you share it with your friends. Remember, guys, as sir said, the Indian Army. isn't out there in mainstream media as much as it should be out there the american army is spoken about so much even the british army is spoken about so much and here we have an army that's widely respected all over the world an army that is considered to be one of the most efficient one of the most deadly armies that's what this episode aimed to do there's no conversation with a former army person or a current army person that i personally don't gain from that i personally don't learn from soldiers are just built differently they train to think differently i hope it's made you think as much remember to follow the ranvi show on spotify we're a spotify exclusive now every episode is available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world This was another incredible Indian Army themed episode of the Ranveer Show. Lots more coming your way. Do let us know by commenting on social media, by sending us your DMs. Tell us which other Indian Army heroes would you like to see on the Ranveer Show and the Ranveer Show Hindi. We'll try our best to bring them to you guys. If you enjoyed this episode, hit thumbs up, share it with your friends. Jai Hind! Happy Independence Day.